check it with. Look at that. Now, freeze frame with that. See, now that's not vertical, but he's, actually that's a screw hole, and he should be able to have his forearm at this angle. He's out here. He could be in, he could be inside there, inside horizontally inside a vertical. That's where baseball pitchers want to have their arm at release. Okay, horizontally inside a vertical. Not vertical, vertical's nice, but certainly we don't want to be outside a vertical. Look at it. I just love the way he used that uh, Latissimus Dorsey. And his spin axis on, on this pitch, you see the, the ball is spiraling. We could count those, because he's got it spinning pretty good. 500 frames a second. That ball's spinning pretty good. Now, I, I probably shut the camera off by now, and so it's just winding down. <clears throat> but even though he's not getting those seams to come forward, he gets an awful lot of bite out of this pitch and a lot of great movement. I call that the Max Line 2 screwball. And this is a side view. All right, pretty good position there. And you're going to see, uh, watch the elbow. Watch the elbow, point of the elbow, right here. Look at that. See it stop? Did you see that elbow stop and then the forearm move forward? That's a concept called force coupling. Have you ever heard of force coupling? Anybody? No, oh, you guys. Force coupling is when you have parallel and oppositely directed forces operating on either side of a fulcrum. You see it like in the hockey, when you come through and they hit and you, you, you see they'll snap it. And you can do it in baseball, batting, where you have this force going forward and then you pull the bat back. Parallel and optically directed forces working uh, on either side of a fulcrum. We can do it with our pitching motion. That is how you can maximize the acceleration with your pitching form. Rather than being out here and pulling the whole arm forward with the pectoralis major, we can now separate the force applied by the uh, upper arm and the forearm and gain more velocity. Okay, we'll just sort of watch the rest. This is a fastball. Move, this fastball moves to the pitching arm side of home plate, going a little drop step, move his entire body over. That'll help him release the ball uh, outside of the glove side of the pitching rubber. Pitching rubber is 24 inches wide, home plate is 17. See how the ball moves this way. Not good for a left-handed hitter wants to turn, pull the ball, and tough on a right-handed hitter bringing it in on it if they want to go the other way. What's the velocity? Pardon me? What's the velocity? How fast is he going? Oh, I don't know. Uh, he, he, he pitched Major League Baseball. At, at the last the last section of my baseball pitch instruction video has video of him pitching Major League Ball. In, in the 30 and one-third innings of Major League pitching that he uh, pitched, he struck out 41 batters. If you watch that video, you will see a devastating pitcher that hitters had no idea what to do with. Unfortunately, they found out that I trained him and they released him. Sounds paranoid, but the facts are the facts. Didn't the pitching coach just see the, the way he was throwing? I mean, obviously, he's using your, he's using your, uh, your technique, right? Yeah. I mean, they're obviously going to see that. I mean, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah, they see it and they got upset. Of course, he wasn't at that time using. We were trying to hide it with a little bit of, you know, the phony leg lift. We're really, we're really not doing anything. We're not turning the hips or anything. We're just looking, put a little action in there. They said they, he thought he looked like he was a, a farmer, plowboy, is such a abbreviated kind of move. That's a sinker. We just saw a fastball. That's what it looks like at normal speed, which makes it very hard to hit. Here's at uh, one quarter speed, which means there are four, four pictures of the same frame. Now there's the circle on the front. I don't want to get real technical. What time do we have, Greg? You got about 45 minutes. How much? 45 Great. Back of the elbow. Beautiful. Put your forearm. There it is. Now that was reasonably, I mean, it wasn't vertical, but it's close. That I call the circle of friction. You know, have you ever heard of the Marshall? Uh, the, the Magnus effect of the Bernoulli's fluid fault principle explaining why a curveball breaks. I don't know if you've had that or not in the class. Well, this is I call the Marshall effect because instead of having the top seams hitting the air and causing greater pressure, I put a circle of, uh, of seams rotating forward, and they contact the air and cause the ball to move down. And here's his sick release. And notice he is continually moving his hips forward. 
the, uh, I didn't show you, but uh, at release, uh, you, uh, I, I showed you, but I didn't make a big deal of it. The pitching foot uh, was within uh, six to ten inches of the pitching rubber. Notice where his pitching knee was beside his uh, pitching knee was beside his glove knee at release. So he's continually rotating the hips forward. Curveball. Watch this. Curveball that breaks the other way than going into the batter. There's the release of that. There's the curveball. Now we'll see the high speed of it. Watch the back of the elbow. He's got a little bit of a hook there on his arm action. I uh, don't think he needs. Look at the back of the elbow. Isn't that fabulous how it's coming forward? You see the triceps contracting. There's the release. Now watch him pronate. See him pronate immediately. That means he pronated through release. Here's the curveball and the spin axis of it. And you can count each one of those revolutions. Traditional curveballs rotate 10 to 12 times on the way to home plate. His is in the 20s. My pitchers. Several of my pitchers have gotten into the 20s with their uh, rotation. The more rotation, the greater the force it applies, the quicker the movement it has. And we release the ball as high as we can possibly reach, up on our tippy toes. It's good to release a curveball really high because then it can break a lot down. Whereas if you release out here, this high versus out here, it's a foot, two foot maybe, adds to the quality of the pitch. Here's the torque fastball, which is a fastball that moves to the Glove side of home plate. We threw the max line and moved back to the other side. Glove foot land shows us that we have our arm up to drive line height before uh, the glove foot land, or when the glove foot lands. Now see how nicely that ball moves? Now we'll see that he pronates release when we see the high speed version of that. A lot. So he comes up. We don't stride open here, we stride straight ahead, maybe a little close. That grab is going to cause a little bit more plow than we want, but still back of the elbow, because this was towards it. Now look at that release. And there, and now immediate pronation. Now watch the spin axis on this pitch. Notice how he has the outside of the pitching outside of the ball tilted slightly forward, which is why the ball moves to the glove side of home plate. He, he, he bends his arm a little tighter than I'd like to see him do right here, which means he causes the ball uh, to uh, circle. We don't want it to circle. There's the release. Reaching as high as he can. He's six foot three, and then his arms are long, so he's up there. But his release point is really far back compared to most of these pictures. It's no, actually, traditional pictures release the ball behind their ear. He is, he is several inches out in front. They say that they release it way out here, but high-speed film shows that they don't. They release it actually by even with their nose. And this is a slider. So this would be a two-seam pitch. It'll spiral. I love how he's got his hips in such a solid. It's very powerful. You can see he's powerful all the way through the pitching motion with his entire body. The lower body doesn't stop applying force. He's pulling back with his glove leg and driving forward with his pitching leg. There's the release. And you notice that he has his hips turned beyond perpendicular forward. It's not laying way back here, but he's actually got a forward uh, position of the hips, the acetabular line. And we'll see that on, on this one. I'll show it on this one. At release, and we're trying to stop it at release. Watch the hip, hip up. And freeze. Okay, if you look at the acetabular line, it is a little bit ahead of perpendicular, whereas in the traditional pictures, they're about 45 degrees behind perpendicular. So that means we're getting rotation through release. Um, American Sports Medicine Institute, anybody other than the guys that I talked to, they're, they're a research institute uh, that Dr. Andrews had. Their research shows that the traditional baseball pitchers stop rotating their hip forward one third of the way through the drive line, stop rotating their shoulders forward one half the way through the drive line. Well, it's rotation that gives you the fastest movement. You cannot bend forward anywhere near as fast as you can rotate. 
Just watching the Olympics, you should know that with a skater jump up and do a, a quad. You jump up, spin four times. If you're trying to bend forward, you, would, you wouldn't get half a bend in. So spinning is the thing to do. We rotate our hips all the way through the drive line, still rotating the hips, not stop, not laying back there like a big anchor holding you back, but rotating forward. In terms of the biomechanical principles, this is a perfect pitching motion. He may not execute every part of it correctly, but the motion is perfect. All right? It's what should be done. There's not going to be any injury caused to the knees, the lower back, um, any part of your body, the hips. There'll be no hip replacement, no knee replacements. Uh, no, you don't land out here, all that stress on the uh, you know, anterior cruciate ligament of the glove leg when it lands. Uh, no stress on the arm. There's no bouncing of the elbow. The, it is as efficient and effective as a, a force application technique can be, at least in my humble opinion. Humble opinion. That one got by the boards a long time ago, didn't it? Okay, how do I get this to stop now? I want one more to show you. You want? Just yeah, I want to change uh, this. Oh, you want to change this? this yeah, I got another, I got another one. All right. That's the name of this. I'm going to stop it right there. Part of my doctoral program was motor, learning motor skill acquisition. Well, how do you teach skills to people? Well, it's nice if you start with a clean slate. You know, it's easier to teach a skill to somebody who's never performed that skill before because there's no motor engram that is imprinted on that activity. A motor engram is a, is a realignment of the uh, nerves in the motor cortex that have you do things on automatic. When a child first learns to walk, however they learn to walk, whatever that is, they do that, and after walking a number of times, taking a thousand or two, uh, ten thousand steps or so, that will imprint, and they'll walk that way again for the rest of their life, unless they consciously try to change it. So when, it, when you teach a, a young pitcher how to pitch, and they do it from age eight to 18, there's an old motor imprint sitting up there about pitching. And every time they go to pitching, that thing wants to fire. It's a computer program that's interfered with the new computer program you're trying to write. And if it gets on that track, it'll mess everything up. Easiest thing to do is start with a clean slate, doing it this way. I can teach an eight-year-old in two weeks what takes two years to get out of an 18-year-old of 10 years of traditional pitching. It is a bear to override a previous motor engram. We need to start teaching people early to do it right, okay? And I have dads all across the country doing that, and their kids are doing amazing things. And it's, a, it's just tough, and I sympathize like crazy with the guys that are trying to make these adjustments. But the beauty of this is, if you make some of them uh, do a little bit, you can be a lot better than you were, and you can be injury-free. It's not that hard to become injury-free. It's very difficult to become perfect. How, uh, how many years, uh, what, what do they say, only perfect practice make perfect? Well, you got to get to you can do it perfect before you can have perfect practice. And that's not that easy to do. It takes a lot of hard work. Anyway, this drill, what I call the half reverse pivot drill, the whole idea of this drill is to prevent the pitcher from taking his arm laterally behind his body and forcing him to use latissimus dorsi. So if I'm starting here, now this is a screwball. So what, and I'm going to throw the ball that way. I want to turn around, but I want to put my foot down here uh, with my foot at 45 degrees. And so I bring my arm, I just swing my arm up, and then I drive back my elbow this way. I want to drive the ball, so I'm driving down my acromial line. Acromial line, okay? Shoulder line, line that goes through the uh, glenoid uh, processes and through the acromial processes. I don't care, whatever name you want. So we're here, and I want to drive it down the acromial line. And that's what this drill is. All right, where am I here? Oh, yeah, start. And that was a screwball record speed using the half reverse pivot. Now I'm going to one quarter speed, which again means I'm showing the same picture four times. I can't increase the number of pictures, I just show them four times. And there's release. Now we'll see the front view, and we'll see how well this young man is getting the back of his pitching upper arm forward. Now notice that he had a little bit, if you watch the arm actually went a little bit in front, but basically he's sticking his arm straight into the strike zone. Should be able to pick it here, watch. Up. 
their vertical inside of 